Hey everybody, this is Stephanie from Apex Languages. Having a fun election week yet? For me personally, all this indecision is making me sick to my stomach. But that's okay because I've got a new video to cheer us all up. Hopefully. Students are always asking what this weird electoral college thing is they keep hearing about on the news. So I figured there's no time like the present to clear up any confusion about our wonderful presidential election system. The year was 1787. The place, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The United States of America had only been a country officially for four years, but it was already realizing that the government they had designed under the Articles of Confederation was no good. Their biggest mistake? Giving too much power to individual states and not leaving enough authority for the central government to keep them all playing nicely together. Remember, the Founding Fathers were making history. No colony had ever won independence from its European master before. Thousands of years had passed since the direct democratic elections of ancient Greece and the Roman Republic. So, basically, none of these guys really had any idea what they were doing. All they knew was that they were sick of kings. So, what if their first experiment had failed? Scientists at heart? They knew all that meant was that they would have to learn from their mistakes and try again. They threw out the old government and agreed to start from scratch. Through much argument and compromise, from the ashes of the Article of Confederation would rise the American Constitution, today the world's longest surviving written government charter. That means they must have done at least something right, right? One of several big arguments during the Constitutional Convention was about how to elect a new leader, the president, the most powerful man in the entire country. There were several major factions or groups opposing each other for various reasons. Many delegates insisted that the Congress should have nothing to do with this process because that could lead to conflicts of interest and corruption. Remember those three branches of power? They wanted the people to elect the president directly. Others, however, argued that the people could not be trusted to vote. First of all, they did not have reliable access to election information. Who was running? What did they stand for? Etc. Fair enough. In the 18th and 19th centuries, where the majority of citizens lived on isolated farms and probably couldn't read anyway. Much less relevant for voters today in the 21st century, though. Probably closer to the heart of the matter, other arguments centered on the rich man's fear of a democratic mob. A mob is a lawless, rioting group of people that have basically lost all common sense and self-control. So the idea was that if you gave the poor, uneducated masses too much power, they might rise up in rebellion and cause problems. At the same time, if you give these easily led idiots too much power, that might also encourage populist politicians to gather their support, giving such individuals the backing needed to basically start a class war. Lots of problems. Of course, the poor aren't really dumb, but neither are nor were the wealthy elite. And so the forefathers knew that the key to staying in power was keeping power away from the little man, not to mention women or minorities. Speaking of which, there is one final group to consider, Southerners. Sorry guys, in the South at that time, African slaves accounted to 40 to 60% of the population. That's right, in places like Virginia, the majority was owned by the minority. And since these slaves were not actually considered human beings, it was debatable whether they should count towards the state's population at all. Of course, they didn't have the right to vote. The less citizens, the less political influence for Southern aristocrats, the poor things. Instead, 
those delegates favored a representative system that would count each slave as at least part of a person, three-fifths to be exact. The Founding Fathers eventually great compromise the Electoral College. And no, it's not a university. In this case, college just means an organized group of people with special rights and powers to achieve a specific task. A temporary group, I might add. It's only assembled once every four years. Each state gets the same number of representatives as they have in Congress. So, as you can see from my beautiful reproduction of the 2016 electoral map, each state gets two votes from the Senate, plus more depending on their population, courtesy of the House of Representatives. Note that these numbers are redistributed every time we have a census. California, with 55, gets the most by a long shot, with Texas coming in second and New York third. In the meanwhile, poor Alaska, even though it's huge, has a tiny population and therefore only receives one extra vote. That's another controversial issue surrounding the college. During the entire campaigning process, high population swing states tend to get all the attention, while small or consistent states are ignored. California's important, but it always votes Democrat, so Republicans don't really waste much time there. But our own dear North Carolina tends to be harder to predict. Sometimes we vote blue, Democrat, and sometimes red, Republican. Our 15 votes don't seem like much, but they're more than most states get. Therefore, we can't seem to get rid of candidates all election season long. Lucky us. So, as you can see, when you vote in a United States presidential election, you're not actually voting for the president, him or herself, but advising your state's representatives how to use their votes. That's right, advising. Believe it or not, the college reserves the right to vote however they want, if the Democratic mob gets a little too crazy. The first candidate to get 270 out of 538 possible votes wins. Regardless of the popular vote, this year marks our 59th presidential election. We've had 45 presidents so far, pending this week's results. Of those, five elections have been complicated by the electoral system. Twice in just 16 years, a candidate has won the popular vote, the people's choice, but lost the election and did not become president. Let's look at those numbers from 2016. Hillary Clinton actually won the last election by almost 3 million votes, but it didn't matter because she didn't have the college behind her. There's a real possibility now that the same thing could happen this year with Biden decisively ahead in votes, but the electoral college hanging by a thread. For better or worse, this is the system we have here in the United States. It's not my place to give you my opinions on the matter, but it is my job to give you homework. <laughs> Don't worry, I didn't forget. Write me below in the comments or in a separate email describing the political process of how you elect leaders in your country. Alternatively, you could compare and contrast our governments, or write your own thoughts about what I've talked about today. Nicely, please. There are lots of different ways to practice your English here, so get creative. With that, I leave you. Back to the uncertainty, into the unknown. Whatever this week brings, I thank you as always for watching. Check out my other, mostly happier, videos at apexlanguages.com. Stay happy, healthy, and safe.